Order, order, and welcome to today's session of the Transport Select Committee. Uh, before I ask the uh, witnesses today to uh, introduce themselves, uh, I've just got uh, three little items of housekeeping. Uh, firstly, for uh, the comfort of our witnesses today, I'm going to have a short adjournment uh, to the session at approximately uh, half past ten. Um, secondly, could I remind colleagues uh, so that all witnesses can uh, identify who we are, if you could state your name uh, before asking any questions. Uh, and thirdly, can I remind uh, both witnesses and colleagues uh, that this is a formal proceeding of the House of Commons and certain rules about referring to specific court cases apply. Uh, so can I therefore ask you not to make reference to the details or merits of any live cases uh, which are currently before the courts at any stage. Uh, and that includes applications for judicial review uh, which entail the court being asked to take a decision on whether to allow uh, a ju judicial review. We can of course talk more generally about uh, the policy issues involved and indeed past cases which indeed might be very helpful uh, in uh, in getting to the, the nub of the issues. Uh, so can I start by uh, inviting each of the, the panel to introduce himself, stating your name uh, and position uh, for the purposes of our records. And if I could start with uh, Doug Pauly on my, my left. Thank you. Yes, I'm Doug Pauly. I'm a disability rights campaigner. Thank you. My name's Catherine Cassidy. I'm a barrister specialising in equality, discrimination, human rights law at Cloisters Chambers. Thank you. Hello, I'm Caroline Stickland. I'm the Chief Executive of Transport for All, the disabled people's organisation focused on access to transport. Thank you. Professor Lawson? Hello, I'm Anna Lawson and I'm a Professor of Law at the University of Leeds. Um, and I have my guide dog Finn here as well. Thank you. Uh, all welcome and thank you very much indeed for giving us your time uh, and experience uh, today. Uh, this uh, session is part of our accessibility and transport uh, inquiry. Um, over the last few months we've heard a raft of evidence about uh, quite frankly appalling experiences that disabled people often have, or have uh, when travelling. Uh, our exam question, if you like, is to look at is this a product of a problem with uh, legislation and regulations, uh, whether there's a gap uh, in them or uh, some revision is required? Is it a problem of enforcement? Most likely, probably a mix of the two. Uh, but could I start by asking each of you briefly to summarise your thoughts uh, as to why many people aren't able to travel as easily as they should, uh, despite the, the suite of uh, legislation that is in place. Uh, again, if I could start on my left uh, with Doug. Thank you. Um, much of the transport rights legislation is 20, 25 years old legislation and regulations and yet we're still fighting for basic compliance with that legislation, let alone looking at more forward thinking legislation which would make it um, better than that 25 year old benchmark. It's very sad that um, the legislation is so regularly not followed and I think that's problems partly with the complexity of the legislation. Um, it is ridiculously complex and siloed and partly a problem with the will for regulation and difficulties in enforcement. So I think there's a combination of issues as to why um, from a legislative and enforcement point of view that disabled people don't get the access that we need and deserve. Thank you. That's a very helpful uh, introduction. Catherine, if we could uh, turn to you next. Um, yes, I, I, think, I, I think I would agree with, um, with what, what Doug has said. Um, the, when the Equality Act was passed, it was intended to simplify the legislation. It consolidated a number of different pieces of anti-discrimination legislation, um, including uh, the Disability Discrimination Act. I think what it did was create, um, create some great difficulties for people who wanted to bring claims. Um, the way that transport is dealt with in the Equality Act 
um, is in three three different ways. You have access, provision for accessibility regulations, which deal with the, the physical um, aspects, for example, of, of trains or buses. Then you have anti-discrimination provisions, which are the, the bits which people bring claims under. And then you have criminal provisions relating to taxes, for example. Um, you, you add to that schedules which explain how the different bits work and then you add to that the exceptions and the European regulations which overlay that um, and transport providers themselves don't necessarily know whether they're dealing with the European regulations or whether they're dealing with the Equality Act. Um, individuals don't know which bits they should deal with um, and I think you have a very unclear picture and then it's difficult for people to bring claims to get legal aid um, to get support. Um, so all of that, I think, adds to a very difficult enforcement regime. Thank you. Caroline. Thank you. I just wanted to sort of zoom out a little bit and then answer your question, I think, just sort of to put the, the challenges with the legislation in the context of the challenges that disabled people across our community face to transport generally. So um, the latest data shows that we make around 38% fewer trips than non-disabled people, and that's for lots of different reasons in terms of physical infrastructure barriers, attitudinal barriers with staff or other passengers, information and communication barriers, not being able to find the information we need to plan or take a journey. And I think the, the expectation or the hope across our community is that the legislation should be there to help remove those barriers, but all too often we actually see the legislation and the processes around it, the processes of making complaints, the fragmentation of the different regulations across the different modes, actually becoming a barrier in and of itself, um, when really it should be there to remove those other barriers. And I think, I'm sure we'll dig into it a, a little bit later on this morning, but issues such as having to take individuals having to take uh, claims under the Act, individuals having to make complaints, individuals really having that burden of trying to enforce the law to remove those barriers ourselves is really not the right way around. So, yeah, and I think the, the key points for me is that there's, there's so many barriers to making a journey, but unfortunately at the moment the legislation seems to be a compounding barrier rather than removing those ones that exist. Thank you. Diana. Thank you very much. Um, it's a bit difficult going after everybody <laughs> else, but I would endorse everything that's been said already. And um, just to add a few words to that, I think another problem is is maybe that we just don't um, have we, we accessibility doesn't have a high enough profile across. You know, the, there's the equality. Equality includes accessibility, but it's kind of hidden away a little bit. And in other countries, there is more of an effort being made to really foreground the importance of accessibility as an issue and really link that to the development of standards in a, in a co-productive way and um, you know, link those standards then to something like the Equality Act, their equivalent. Um, to, to, and we could do that. We have the, the, the regulation-making powers in, um, in the Equality Act to, to, to make assumptions about what is reasonable, but if we just leave it to what's reasonable, it leads to very um, potentially expensive cases, um, which are just too burdensome for individuals. Thank you, and that uh, neatly leads on to, to my next question, and that is, again, from each of you, I'll, I'll go the other way down the panel, starting uh, with Anna, just to give us an overview of how easy or difficult, I suspect it will be, it is for an individual who wants to challenge a, a, a transport operator uh, over their failure to provide an adequate uh, service for them. Mm. Uh, and, you know, firstly, complaining to them, but if they're not getting any uh, redress there, how then it might be escalated. So, Anna, if you, again, it's a very general question, but uh, if you're able to give us an, an overview as yes. to how easy or difficult okay. it is. Thank you. Well, again, I feel I'm um, Doug... Doug has the first-hand experience of this, which um, so I'm going to be brief, but um, I think the first point is knowing <coughs> where to make a complaint to. Um, the, the systems are very complex. There's no one channel that you can go through to, to make a complaint. Um, when I've had trouble, often people working in the transport system have said, oh, just use Twitter. 
but I actually don't use Twitter, <laughs> so that's not an option for me. But that's that's you know from inside the system, people are recognising that actually it's quite it's quite difficult to use the complaint system. Twitter tends to be much more effective, um, or X, whatever it's called now. Um, and then there are other problems around bringing cases under the. Um, Equality Act, which are, you know, finding legal advice is a massive problem because there are fewer and fewer lawyers available, solicitors available, who specialise in this area, which is a complex area, and disability equality is particularly complex. So even though some people might specialise in other types of discrimination work, um, that, you know, reason and the anticipatory reasonable adjustment, um, which is the one that's relevant to transport, isn't relevant there, and it's not relevant to employ, employment in the disability sector, where again, there's, there was, there's more focus of expertise there than there is in services areas. Um, and, the, and then if you do manage to get a lawyer, there are financial, significant financial risks. Um, I'm not going to talk about a live case here, but I'm aware of a case that happened in Leeds a, a while ago that was concerned with transport infrastructure and an attempt to bring a case um, to prevent um, barriers being built in. Um, the, the case was lost and the person concerned was threatened for a while with having to pay the costs, the very heavy costs of the, um, the local authority because they used an expensive barrister and he was thinking he'd have to sell his house, he didn't know how he would tell his wife. <laughs> um, so the, the financial risks are a huge deterrent, um, and the law is so complex, it's difficult to get it right. Thank you very much. Uh, Caroline. Thank you. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit more to kind of the, the part of your question about sort of the initial, <laughs> how do you make a complaint when something goes wrong? Um, and I would echo what Anna said of the response that many members of our community get from transport staff when something does go wrong, which happens very often, is, oh, don't worry, you can just make a complaint, as if that's as easy as, as, as pie, really. Um, and that's really, really not the case for a lot of reasons. So there's clearly a, a time uh, requirement to sit and make a complaint. I was talking to one of our members this week, and she told me that over the last month, 75% of her taxi journeys um, have included a driver charging her while they were putting the ramps out for her to disembark, which is illegal. So that is the kind of frequency and regularity of where things are going wrong. If you were to complain every single time something went wrong, I'm not sure you could have a job or caring responsibilities or study or do all the things that really make, our, uh, make a difference to our lives. Also, a lot of us live with low energy or energy impairments and def may not have kind of the spoons or the, the energy levels and resources to spend time making complaints. Um, also, the, the process of re reporting a complaint, whether that's on a website or filling out a complex form, can be really inaccessible for those of us who don't have the internet. <coughs> so 23% of us don't have internet access in the disabled community. Um, or those of us perhaps with learning disabilities or other impairments where that's just really not a process that we'd be able to do um, easily and independently. And then lastly, I think the complexity also comes in when we think about the fragmentation of the system. So our research at Transport for All shows that the most common part of a journey where things go wrong is an interchange. So how do we know exactly which bit of the, you know, if we're standing on that bit of the pavement or that bit of the station, is that the train operator's responsibility? Is it the underground? Is it the bus operators? Is it the local authority? And even just finding out who you're meant to complain to sometimes needs kind of like a PhD. So when you take all of those things together, it's really clear that we're not always going to complain <coughs> when something goes wrong. Um, so I just encourage colleagues to think about sort of who's not in the data that we're looking at today, who hasn't made a complaint, and who hasn't taken a case because of all of those barriers. Thank you. Uh, Catherine. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think I'd probably just add a, a little bit to what's already been said. Um, there are few and far between solicitors who, who do take this sort of work. Um, often, when I see a case, it's it's, it's at the stage where proceedings are about to be issued. Um, and often people have a catalogue of complaints 
because they've got to the stage where they really can't deal with it anymore. They've had numerous complaints. They have complained. Nothing's been done about it. Um, what may happen then is that a defendant will say this case is out of time because you've waited for so long, really you should have been taking your case much earlier, which is a problem. Um, no, sorry, just remind me, what is the that time the, period? The time limit is six months. Six months, right. Yeah. yeah. And there are some complexities around the time limit for a failure to make reasonable adjustments as well. Um, there, is a, there is a discretion for the court. It can allow a, time, a claim out of time if it's just inequitable to do so. Um, but, uh, but defendants will, um, if, they, if they want to argue that something's out of time, and indeed if they want to um, rack up costs, may apply for a strike out of the claim um, at an early stage. And if, they, if they're successful in that... Um, then, then costs can be awarded at that stage and they can be quite significant. Um, and claimants can get very anxious about that as well. So it's, it's, it's quite a, a significant deterrent. Um, you can get legal aid, um, but the merits tests are quite hard. Um, and in, particularly in cases, and it's often the case with a, with a transport case, that it's the first of its kind. Um, so it's very difficult then to say, well, this has got more than 50% prospect of success. You can say this is going to make a very significant difference, but legal aid might not be awarded. You can get funding from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, but again, when you get that funding, um, it, it, it can depend entirely. Um, so there are significant challenges for people bringing cases, and if they want to bring them on their own, um, then it can be even more difficult, because I think there is, there is not only... Um, there's not only a, 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 a cost, um, a cost potentially financially, but also emotionally, which, which I think Caroline has, has already dealt with. It's a very difficult process for people. Um, yeah, I think that's probably what I'd say at this stage. Thank you. And Doug? There's a case in my name, Paulie versus First Bus, in which Cathy very ably represented <coughs> me, that was um, the first case on goods and service, a service provision to get to the Supreme Court and that couldn't happen in the same way again now because of changes in cost protection <coughs> um, at the at first instance so in county court we had what they call after the event insurance which um, makes which protects the claimant against what can be significant costs if the case is lost and it's it's you know even with the best case in the world it's very difficult to guarantee that it's going to win particularly in the area of transport and disability rights where there's been so little case law um, and it used to be that you could reclaim the very significant insurance claims for after the event insurance but now you can't um, since last po the legal aid and sentencing and uh, punishment offenders act um, but also for other um, case areas, they extended what's called qualified one-way cost shifting so that the risk is much less if you're bringing a case. But they didn't for disability discrimination cases. So it would, as it stood, the, the first bus case, if it was to happen now, couldn't get off the ground. And also, as mentioned, there's very few... Um, solicitors who will take on such cases because it is such um, an unpredictable area of law, but also because the law is very little understood um, or enforced. I mean, in general, you just have to walk or wheel down a street and see the number of barriers that disabled people experience, and the you know the reasonable adjustments aren't done in general, let alone in transport. The government, so I understand, um, originally split off some areas of transport in, from the civil duty, partly to give um, operators more time to sort themselves out, but partly also, um, in theory, to take the burden of responsibility off um, disabled people and onto regulators and other enforcers. And that has fundamentally not worked because the regulators and enforcers, to one degree or another, don't know or enforce the law or don't know what's going on on the ground, in my experience. Um, I'm unusual in, as a disabled person in that I nerd the regulations to a ridiculous extent and so kind of 
um, uh, on occasion have caught out the industry. Um, for example, all of the national coach operators were openly telling wheelchair users that they had to give 36 hours notice um, to travel, and yet that was um, illegal. It was a criminal offence under the driver conduct regulations which say that um, wheelchair users must not be required to give any more notice than anybody else. But the regulator, the DVSA, either hadn't noticed that this was happening or hadn't realised that it was um, a criminal offence until I pointed it out. And I don't, I'm trying not to be egotistical here, it's just kind of a frank statement of what happened. And, and the same for home-to-school buses. Um, I pointed out that home-to-school buses were required, when, except for if everybody on the bus travelled for free and no payment was made to anybody for their right to travel. Um, Parliament, um, it's, it's in the House of Lords um, debates, records from 2005, I think, said, well, most home-to-school buses are caught by the Public Service Vehicle Accessibility Regulations and thus have to meet those access requirements. And yet, all around the country, it wasn't happening until I nerded the law and pointed it out. And the same with rail replacement buses. Nobody realised until I approached Cathy and um, somebody else and, and asked about it and, and said, this is what I think is happening. And the industry suddenly went, oh, yeah. And I and wonder why the, it's, it was frankly said by the DVSA that the reason they're now having to issue mass exemptions from the um, access regulations for buses in these circumstances or vehicles is because the DVSA failed to realise and enforce the law at the time. Um, so when you try to, or trying to, these the conduct regulations on buses. Um, which I've mentioned already, but that they set out what drivers are required to do. And nobody has ever been prosecuted for breach of these. It's like nobody, to the best of our knowledge, has ever been prosecuted for running inaccessible vehicles where accessible vehicles are required. Yet it is a criminal offence, and it does happen. I mean, it's been happening... Um, routinely on home to school rail replacement when Flixbus started in the UK they used inaccessible buses and yet nobody faces prosecution and when I try to um, get um, organisations like the police, transport, British Transport Police to get involved um, when I'm not strapped in properly on a rail replacement bus or um, when other criminal law has been broken I face first having to explain to the police and really enforce, look, this is a criminal offence. Um, nobody prosecutes it other than you. Um, it is a hate crime in that it is blatantly done as a result of discrimination, you know? And, and, and it, it doesn't work. This whole idea that the burden's taken off the disabled person um, by it being enforceable by other bodies doesn't work because the other bodies don't enforce it either. Thank you. And uh, uh, later on uh, in this session, I want to uh, look at the, the role of regulator, regulators in uh, enforcement. Uh, but for now, can I turn to my colleague, Carl McCartney, Thank you. to uh, ask a supplementary? Yep. Um, just very quickly, it's going to be two or four, but I'm going to split it up. So Catherine and Caroline, I'm going to come to you two first. Um, you probably deal, Catherine, with quite a lot of the more serious cases, I would have thought. <laughs> Are there anybody you want to name and shame or say that there's particular organisations or particular sectors that aren't doing well compared to others that are perhaps doing slightly better? Um, I, I, I probably don't deal with anyone who, who does slightly better, mm. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I mean, I, I tend generally to see, to see things when they've, when they've gone wrong. Um, I, I don't tend to, to see... Which, which sector do you deal mostly with then? Is it buses, is it trains, or um, is it, it airlines? It's a, it's a combination. I don't, de I don't see many airlines um, because, because of the fact that, it's, it's, that there is nothing that one can do under discrimination law when there's a problem on, on airlines because of the Montreal Convention. Um, and that's particularly problematic... Um, because uh, because what I have come across are some pretty horrific 
story is. I think when things go wrong on airlines, they go wrong very, very badly. Um, and I have come across some, some pretty horrific um, examples of mistreatment um, and, uh, uh, and ignorance, I think. For one, yes, I think that is the word. Um, but from a legal perspective and a discrimination perspective, there is nothing that can be done. Um, in, in the context of other modes of transport, um, with buses, I would say, and this is obviously generalising from the cases that I've dealt with, it's attitudinal issues, drivers. Um, uh, and I would hope that that improves with training, um, but that, that has been the, the most significant issue. Um, and lots of repeat offenders. Um, with trains, it's assistance breaking down. And again, that's repeated. Um, I, I can't say that either of those industries is any better. Um, what I see are repeat offenders and people come to me, um, when they come to me, it's, it's been repeated and these are people who put up with an incredible amount. And I think, as, as Caroline said, if people made complaints, I mean, the, the, the cases that I deal with, if people brought cases for every time there had been a breach of legislation, they would be in court all the time and they would do nothing but bring cases. Thank you for that. Caroline, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, absolutely echo what Catherine said. I think um, the other point I wanted to bring in, obviously, you, you've spoken a little bit, Catherine, to the sort of the different modes and <coughs> tendency. I think I'd also just want to highlight the kind of stages of the transport ecosystem where these breaches can occur so there's been a uh, quite a hot topic recently around kind of the processes around transport consultations uh, and whether or not people who are running consultations are sticking to the gunning principles and having uh, documents for consultations in accessible formats released in good time and so on so um, I think it, it's not just sort of looking at each mode we also need to look at each stage of the transport kind of ecosystem process from consultation through to <coughs> delivery um, and, and these breaches happen at every stage of that um, including while we're on the journey but also before when decisions are being made. Thank you. Um, Professor Anna Lawson, um, Carl McCartney, um, one of the members here, I'm going to ask or pick up really on something you, you said in your opening statement which um, I, I like to look at the positives and you mentioned that it was perhaps um, abroad internationally there were some countries that were doing a lot better than we are in the UK. Are there any examples in any particular sectors that you'd like to give the committee um, the benefit of your knowledge of so that we can perhaps look at that as we go through our inquiry? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think it would be worth looking at Canada. Um, they've just introduced the Accessible Canada Act and it's, it's partly, you know, they, they, I think they were coming from a similar place to us but realised the need to, to really heighten the profile of accessibility and resource it and place it within the centre of government. Um, so um, that would be, it's quite a recent act and that might be quite an easy model to, to follow. Um, there are limitations with it, we might want to do things a bit differently, but it, you know, it allocates accessibility as an area of responsibility to, to a government minister who then has oversight of that. Um, and it's not just in transport, it's across different areas. Um, so, so that's something that we might want to think about too. Um, and it really, and it, it also creates an accessibility standards body um, and an accessibility commissioner who is a, the, the focal point for, through which you can channel complaints. Um, so, so yeah, it's a nice simple structure, which which isn't hugely expensive, I don't think, but um, <laughs> but might be worth looking at. There's also the United States, which has had a long history of, with them, um, the development of standards through the Access Board, um, and they so they develop accessibility standards within very deep consultation and the involvement of disabled people in their organisations um, and then those standards can get adopted by um, people who enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act and various other things so that they become enforceable as part of equality law. But they also, I think both Canada and America have 
responsibilities on government bodies to, to be proactive in going out and monitoring the, the compliance of these accessibility standards. It's not just a case of waiting till complaints come, if they come, and then we act. There's very strong proactive duties to go out and monitor. And we have, we actually have an example of that here in the connection with the accessibility of websites, which we might draw on. Um, and that's kind of changed, changed the focus a little bit. So, so now there is um, a government body that has responsibility to go out and monitor on a regular basis and write a report every year. Um, but also linked to an easy way for people to raise complaints um, and, and then get channeled through to people who will then investigate without the whole risk of um, financial ruin. Um, and then I think Norway might be another model worth looking at. And that's, again, it has, it has limitations which we could avoid, but they, they, their equality legislation is based on the idea that um, accessibility is really embedded into it. So they, they develop standards, accessibility standards. And once they're introduced, um, there's a very strong presumption that any failure to comply with that it, it is discrimination. So it's very easy to bring discrimination cases and there's a mechanism for doing that which doesn't cost anything. Um, the downside <coughs> of the legislation is, is that if, if an area isn't covered by accessibility standards, it's, it's I know some people think it's, it's even harder to bring a case, but I think we, we, it's already hard enough here. Um, so I think those, that shouldn't be done um, if it, you know, at the cost of reducing protection for areas not covered by standards. Um, but there's no reason why that should be a, a, a payoff. Thank you very much indeed for that. It's most useful and that gives us some, some direction, I think, to look elsewhere for, for good models. Um, can I just ask Doug, is that right? A quick, quick supplement and then we need to make a... a I, I just wanted to give you the opportunity, Doug, to add anything to any of the three panel members and then obviously back to the chairman. Thank you. Um, this whole thing about um, the ability versus obligation to enforce, I mean, there's a common um, analogy where if you get food poisoning in... Uh, uh, a dodgy takeaway somewhere, then you can speak to the local environmental health people who will um, go and inspect and take whatever action and keep you anonymous. Um, and they have a duty to deal with it. But if you're discriminated against, then the only way to enforce is either to take legal action yourself or complain or try and get a regulator to use their discretion to enforce. And I think it's it's that may, makes a fundamental difference to the ability to enforce. Thank you for that, Chair. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Howell, if I could turn to you now. Yep. Thank you, Chair. I'm Paul Howell. I'm the Conservative Member of Parliament for Sedgefield in North East England. Um, just looking, you know, listening to what, what, what you've said, I'm just wanting to try and get a little bit of clarity in terms of the difference between the, the legislation that exists and, and whether that's good enough, but also the actual, it, it sounds like it's, it's a much but actually getting compliance with that legislation from people is, is as much of a challenge as, as, as anything. And maybe start with, you, with yourself, Catherine, on this one, but um, it also feels as though you know, the legislation governing transport accessibility, it, it's like a patchwork of provision, you know, as to whether it's be, you know, Equality Act, the European Law, other acts, etc., etc. Is there a better way to organise it? Sorry, how would you better organise it? Might be a better way to say that rather than, than is there. And almost going back to the questions that were put to Professor Lawson earlier, and you know, are there other examples worldwide of, of, of a, a better way to do it? So, can I start with you there, and, and then we'll digress from there. Yeah, um, I think the, the the difficulty I think at the moment comes from the fact that that there are regulations governing um, rail and bus which we retained. Um, when when we left Europe, um, and because because of the fact the regulations we haven't actually set out anywhere domestically how they apply. Um, so we what we've got at the moment is the, the we've got the Equality Act uh, ostensibly applying to, to to train and buses, but. We also say the Equality Act doesn't apply to anything governed by the regulations. So you have to look at the regulations. 
The regulations apply to ticketing, they apply to assistance. Um, so does the Equality Act apply to assistance at all? Um, now, the Equality Act provisions are worded slightly differently because we have an anticipatory duty, which is the thing that Anna talked about, and it doesn't look like the EU regulations have that. So to give you an example... Please, um, it's, 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 it's difficult <laughs> well, to understand well, the nuances so, of what you're saying even at this so, level. So if, um, if, if someone approaches, um, approaches, approaches us, and I say us, myself and a solicitor that, that I'm working with, um, about the fact that they haven't been provided with assistance um, on a, to get on a train, um, the letter that will be written to that rail provider... Um, is that we'll set out the bits of the EU regulation and we'll set out the Equality Act and we'll say, um, we will say, we, we believe that the Equality Act applies, but if you think the regulation applies, equally, we're saying you breach the regulation. Now, invariably, they come back and say, that either they don't answer it at all, they just put their defence in, or they say, we believe the Equality Act applies. But if you look at... Um, any, anything written about this area, nobody really explains how the regulation applies and how it interacts with the Equality Act because nobody's really done that analysis, so far as I'm aware. I mean, Anna, Anna may, may have a different take on that, but I don't think it's been done. So I think the first thing to do is actually work out because at the moment we've retained the regulation, so it's there. So somebody needs to work. Now, it may be that actually we can't, and what we need is a court to decide how it works for each bit, which is going to take a very long time because these cases don't get to court. Um, so it may be that actually we need to start again with the transport provisions. Um, I know that's not terribly helpful, <laughs> but, but it's been left with a bit of, in a bit of a mess. I, mean, I think you know, the, 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 the obvious question follows, doesn't it? You know, what... Should, if, if, if you were in the position to do the changes, what would you suggest that we started to do? What, what, what should government be doing to try and get this into a better place? Well, I think, I think it has to be... I think the, the obligations have to be spelt out, exactly what it is that service providers have to do. Ideally, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think ideally we need, we need regulations that tell them what, the, what they need to do. It's clarity of legislation, it's the fog that people are using almost as an excuse not to live up to the obligations. Is that what? Well, is that a fair yes, story? yes, or they, or they don't know what or they're supposed need to do. You people like, like Doug to be the nerd that actually digs yeah. the way through the different. different well, yes, yeah, so I think and, uh, when, um, when the Disability Discrimination Act was in force, um, uh, and even when the Equality Act came in, um, I mean, I've been involved in this area for a, a long time, and I, I was quite a fan of. Of the concept of reasonableness, because it does allow allow for you know small providers. It, it allows for a degree of flexibility, um, but I think I don't I don't think it works in certain areas, and I don't think it works in this area. I think you need standards. I think you need, and I think providers need to know what they need to do. So you need some sort of a transport access act or something like that. Something specific. Yeah. Yeah. And before I go into anything else, would anybody else like to add anything to to, to what Catherine said there? She covered the subject here. Caroline. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, to, to agree and to say that I think that <coughs> lack of clarity, particularly when we're thinking about assistance, really trickles down into how, um, how it's captured and how it's reported upon. So, for example, um, train operators are required to report data on pre-booked passenger assistance and the success or, or otherwise of those uh, cases of assistance, but they're not required, as far as we can tell, to publish similar data for Turn Up and Go, which is the, the non pre booked assistance. And it's I think it's a reflection of that lack of clarity and that lack of kind of expectation of what the standards should be, that then there isn't that data to actually hold the regulator and the, the operators accountable for the service that they may or may not be providing. Okay. Uh, yeah, Professor Lawson. Thank you. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so just to chip in there, I think um, going back to the EU, you know, the, the retained law that we had from Europe, um, 
And in a way, we, we, re we retain things that are a bit frozen in time. <laughs> but EU law has developed through the European Accessibility Act. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, that, that has very strong enforcement mechanisms which um, stop things functioning, stop service providers functioning, basically, or selling things if, they're not, if they don't comply. So it's not, it's not the same sorts of... It, it's looking at a different type of um, enforcement mechanism than the ones we can use through the Equality Act, which I think is worth thinking about too. And also, the, that law has very strong links through to procurement processes, which I think, again, is something we really need to embed in, in the transport sector, that accessibility is, is absolutely at the core of any procurement process. Okay, so trying to push it back further in the process so that when people are, <coughs> yeah, when people are trying to procure, a process, procure something, they have a responsibility to make sure it's going to work. Okay, okay. Just, um, you know, when, when, whenever you're trying to fix something, you know, there's, there's almost like uh, a, a priority list. You know, there's the things, you know, if you were going to try and start to fix things. So are there, um, you know, some pretty obvious gaps in legislation when it comes to transport accessibility that, that should be the the top of the list, you know, if you had one or two things that you wanted to get sorted, are there, are there any particular specific focuses there? And probably linked to that is, is, you know, are there any areas of ambiguity that habitually cause problems that should be trying to be picked up on when, when you're trying to make sure that, um, you know, that the rights are able to be enforced and then are enforced? But start with yourself, Doug. Thank you. Um, in the legislation, there are clear lacunae, so to speak, one of which is ships and hovercraft. Um, the Equality Act is completely exempted, as far as I understand, from anything that happens on a ship or hovercraft. Um, the government had the ability to introduce regulations to um, make the Act apply, but hasn't, and so there's just this blanket. And there's also similar problems with um, on on um, air side of airports on, and on aircraft. Those are two areas where the law basically doesn't apply and can't be enforced. Um, ambiguity is very difficult to, to know where to start. There are so many on lack of clarity in, in the Act and in um, the understanding of such by enforcers, providers and the public. I'm kind of at a loss as, as to try and prioritise it, to be honest. It says everything, the fact that there's so much of it. I'll just come along the table this time, Catherine. Um, is there anything to add to that? I, mean, I, I think in, in, terms of, in terms of priorities on the, on the enforcement side, um, I think that Doug mentioned earlier qualified one-way cost shifting. Uh, and, and I do think that it would make a difference if that was extended to discrimination cases because then it would provide cost protection for people who were bringing those cases. So, uh, uh, and I think, I, I, I know that there'll be talk about regulators later, but, uh, but I do think that whilst there is legislation, it's still important that people are able to bring those cases. Um, uh, in terms of amb ambiguities, I, I, I think there are, I, th I think it would, it would be difficult without a wholesale um, revision to, to prioritise, sorry, prioritise particular um, ambiguities. And I, I, I think my, yeah, I think my, my priority would, would be to have standards in relation to, um, to assistance, that standards that were enforceable. All right. Thank you. I, I would just take that point from Catherine about enforcement of standards and sort of expand that out to across the whole kind of transport sector. So although we've talked a little bit about kind of rail and bus where there's some clear regulations, if you look at other parts of the transport system like walking and wheeling or cycling or pavements, a lot of the standards as such there are actually guidance or good practice or you should or you should have consideration or you should make best efforts to um, and that is clearly filled with ambiguity and incredibly difficult to enforce so incredibly difficult for a disabled person to to know um who's in you know whether that's worth even trying to enforce or complain because of that ambiguity that's baked into the guidance there that's right. 
Anything you'd uh, suggest that they've missed or you'd like to enhance, Professor Lawson? Um, I think th th the same points that the others have mentioned, but on, on top of those, I think um, the, the point I made earlier about um, a, an obligation on a, a body to monitor, to, to, to go out and proactively monitor compliance with the standards, so, so building on what Caroline has said about making the standards, more meaningful mm. and, and I think um, alongside that the standards are no use if they're not if they don't um, model accessibility very effectively and I know there are there are instances at the moment where lit there's, there's litigation going on because because of what's in a standard not having been not having created something that's regarded as accessible enough by disabled people so I think how those standards are developed mm. is really important. And Caroline mentioned earlier on something about around the consultation, and, mm. and you know, those, those the development of standards really needs to be de developed in a way that that fully involves disabled people. Okay, thank you very much. Just a, just a, a final point, yeah, quick, 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 just, just because I'm, I'm thinking just where we are now in terms of things. Obviously, looking at yourself, Doug, and the the, the tools you've got to help you be um, move move around. <laughs> that world has changed so significantly over recent times. Mm. Um, is, is there any impact in transport where there needs to be more consideration of the aids people are using to actually get mobile in the first place? And then it'll be back to yourself, Chair. You're obviously the best person to answer this, I would suggest, Doug. Well, I, I, have, I definitely have thoughts. The, the discriminating against scooter users is, is just phenomenal. It's just wrong. Um, if, first of all, there's no clear definition of what a scooter is as opposed to an uh, electric wheelchair. Mm. And then each transport operator having its own different scheme where you have to get a pass to be approved or like ScotRail um, just ban all scooter users unless you can get on and fold it up and put it in a luggage rack. Um, it's, it's just ridiculous. And, and people use scooters for all sorts of reasons these days. There's more and more people using them, and there's no good reason to exclude them from public transport or make life so difficult. Given yeah. that we're time, under time pressure, I'll not come along the committee if that's okay. Sorry, the, the, your witnesses, and I'll just go back to the chair. Uh, thank you, Paul. The concern next to uh, Graeme Morris. Th th thanks, Chair. And, uh, and uh, again, on the legislation, the adequacy or, or, or not of it. And I want to ask about Part 12 of the Equalities Act, um, and uh, it's, it's 13 years old now. And w w although it's 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 perhaps not so much in the news now, um, the ticket office closures. Y you may be aware that the chairman um, wrote to the Rail Minister on behalf of the committee to raise concerns about the proposal to close almost a thousand ticket offices, and. In response to the consultation, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission did raise a number of issues about the consequences and the impact, and that included issues around staffing, digital ticketing, turn up and go, and, and, and in the rep response it said, These, this raises important questions about the compliance of the proposals with the requirements of the Equalities Act 2010 and commitments made under the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I, I just wonder, I, I wonder if I could, if I go to Catherine at first, uh, what, what, are your, what are your views in, in general? I mean, we're talking about access to the system, but particularly in relation to ticket offices, because that's a, a huge concern uh, about the consequences of the staffing reductions and, and is that compatible with equalities legislation and the human rights framework? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> How long have we got? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I haven't, I haven't looked at the, um, I haven't looked at the consultation, but I, I, I will give you my, um, my brief view. I think it. It undoubtedly raises issues. I mean, I've, I have read, read responses about it, and I've read a summary of it. I think it undoubtedly raises issues um, for disabled people in particular, um, because there are people who can't access their tickets in any other way, yeah. because it provides um, uh, staff assistance potentially. Um, 
I think there are issues under the under the Equality Act itself um, in in relation to reasonable adjustments. There are issues under the under the UN Convention which which effectively supplements. I mean, that's a that's so, so a basic Catherine, word. You, you, you're, you're a barrister, aren't you? You're a lawyer. Yes. So, so are there, in your opinion, are, are there legal arguments that, 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 that could be used to challenge the closure of ticket offices on accessibility grounds, mm. or on, on grounds of restricting access to the, uh, to the railway to people with disabilities? I, I mean, I can't... I, I haven't read the consultation in full, um, so I can't give a definite opinion on that, but I can say that it raises... In my view, it's likely to raise issues. Yes, I would certainly say that it raises issues for disabled people. That if you're if you're taking away, would that form the basis of a legal challenge? It could do. Yeah. If if yes, if there, obviously I'm I'll, I'm being cautious. <laughs> <laughs> obviously I'm being cautious because I because I have to be careful. We don't stray into potentially live. Yes, of course. Yes, I, 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 I yes. and I, and I think there are I think there are potential cases going on. Um, but I think undoubtedly, if you are if you are taking away if you're taking away physical physical people from a ticket office where disabled people buy tickets or they access tickets, and there are there are other means there aren't other means for for people to buy those <coughs> tickets, then there is potentially an impact on disabled people, and that impact um, means that they they may not have access to reasonable adjustments. It means that they may not um, there may be human rights issues around transport. Um, so there are potential legal issues there in in the closure. I wonder, Doug, I want to come to you in a moment because you, you raised some interesting points before, before but can I, can I ask uh, Professor Lawson that the, the Part 12 of the Equality Act, it, as, as Doug mentioned, it, it excludes hovercraft and, and aeroplanes. It, it, it only um, um, specifically talks about taxis and public service vehicles and rail vehicles. Now, I don't know whether it was Caroline before said what we need is an accessibility act. I think we, I think we're we're in agreement there. But is there is there any basis for amending the the Equalities Act and Part Twelve of the Act, Professor Lawson? Would that work? Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> can you call me Anna? <laughs> um, I. I well, I think it would be great to have a whole, a whole holistic look at the Equality Act, to be honest. And I know we mentioned earlier on the idea of a, a Transport Access Act, but I, th I, think, uh, I think there are, in other sectors as well, the Equality mm. Act is, is failing. And so I think it would be really sensible to have a good look at the whole of the Equality Act. Um, as far as disabled people are concerned, certainly... Um, and that, that part of the Act is incredibly technical, and a lot of it, you know, it really, I'm not sure it needs to be in the Equality, it makes the Equality Act so complicated, and really if they're dealt with in regulations, um, I'm, I'm not sure they even need to be in the Equality, they don't really, they sit uncomfortably with a lot of the rest of the Equality Act, as Cathy was saying. Um, but they need improving, like the operation of, the so the anticipatory reasonable adjustment duty, um, which Cathy and I have both mentioned, um, it should be really powerful, but although it's called anticipatory, you can only bring a case if you've actually experienced, or it's a, yeah, arguably you can only bring a case if you've actually experienced a disadvantage, which... Um, so in, in, instead of boarding on... Part Twelve of the yeah. of the bill or the Act, you know the Equalities Act. Should, should there be a more holistic approach incorporating um, access for people with disabilities it, 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 throughout the whole of the Act? I think I think that would be sensible. And Part Twelve, I think, has been amended recently to 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 bring in local buses. And um, I think your department has done some. The Department for Transport has done some really. Um, important work around regulations um, around audio and visual information on buses, yeah. which which is a bit of a 
a, a, a bugbear of mine because when the audio announcements came onto buses initially, they were great. And now on nearly every bus I go to, they're turned at, onto such a low volume, you can't actually hear what stops they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so, so without... We need the regulations, and you know there's provision for that in Part 12, so we, don't, we can't lose what's, what's in Part 12, but how Part 12 works and what it extends to needs a good look at, I think, and how it links to the Equality Act, like Cathy was, the, the reasonable adjustments duty in other parts. Of the <coughs> OK, thanks. D Doug, you, you gave the example of scooters uh, in, 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 in Scott Rail, but, but other operators as well. I, I mean, bearing in mind the Equalities Act's 13 years old, it, it, is it still relevant? Um, it, you know, because it it certainly hasn't kept pace with the developments in in electric vehicles and so on. I worry that it does increasingly lose relevance. I mean, I know that the Department of Transport are looking at the regulation size as to what wheelchairs um, have to be um, accommodated on public transport. That's an other area that it doesn't. Um, it, it feels like it has frozen since about the year 2000 with some tinkering around the edges on enforcement of taxis and um, some minor stuff. But there's, what worries me, and it's not my skill set at all, is that there's not been um, the drive for improvement in um, accessibility and legislation around such that there needs to be and as such things have stagnated or even gone backwards I would say. Can, can I ask, th thanks, can, can I ask Caroline, I mean pre-Brexit the government gave various assurances um, not, not just to, to the House and to MPs but, but more broadly to the country that, that elements of EU law particularly in relation to um, uh, accessibility for, for people with disabilities would be enshrined in, in UK law post-Brexit. Do you think they should have done more to uh, honour that commitment? So, unusually for this panel, I am not a lawyer, um, and so I am not going to comment on the kind of specific um, details of the legislation. I think um, I'd just like to kind of bring it back to that the wider point of if we are all broadly in agreement that there are challenges with the with the current legislation, with the enforcement of the regulation. Um, one of the key issues with the Equality Act at the moment is the way it relies on our community to bring cases and to make complaints. And um, frankly, it's, it, it strikes me as that there's probably very few other areas of legislation, like health and safety or food poisoning, like Doug was saying, where the burden consistently gets put back on the minoritised community who are facing the brunt of these issues to try and come up with solutions. And I think we, we just really want to see wholesale change so that that is kind of shifted 180 degrees so that it's not constantly disabled people saying this isn't working, something needs to change. So, so Caroline, with, with the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission, mm -hmm. and, and you know they have, they have looked at issues, well, including recently, ticket office closures mm -hmm. and, and, and they make rulings but they haven't got any enforcement powers have they or can you clarify that um, again I probably defer to one of my <laughs> illegal colleagues I do I do I would really like <coughs> the HRC to do more in the transport sphere I think we can all appreciate how important transport is to getting to work to place yeah. education to, to cultural community centers and um, it, we feel it really should be a priority for the EHRC and others to have a look at this area. In terms of the specific um, enforcement, I would definitely defer to Anna or Catherine. I wonder if Professor Lawson could enlighten me. Yeah. Do, do, they, do they have enforcement powers? And if they don't, should they? They do. They, they have um, some quite useful enforcement powers. So um, they can enter into legal agreements with organisations, um, and I think if they're broken, then they can um, then they can sue them for discrimination without, <coughs> and that would take the burden off um, members of the disabled community. Mm. But they have, uh, and uh, like you say, they they also have um, advisory obligations, so they can advise <coughs> about what they think would be a breach of the Equality Act or the Human Rights. Um, UN human rights um, and infringement of UN human rights treaties but 
that's just advice rather than it's not like a court ruling. Yeah. Um, so the courts are the ones who do the the actual rulings, but but the Equality and Human Rights Commission has 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 some really useful enforcement powers, which should were designed to take the burden off um, members of the marginalised communities, minoritised communities. Um, but they're quite they, they cover all the different protected characteristics, um, and they. They have focused on some issues around accessibility, but accessibility is quite a technical subject and um, they don't necessarily have a lot of people who have expertise in accessibility. And I think trying to rely on them to enforce accessibility is just a non-starter. They, they're just not geared up for it, really. OK, th th thanks for that. That's really helpful. Chairman? Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, it's exactly 10.30, uh, and I uh, promised that we would uh, adjourn uh, for a short break. Uh, so uh, I will suggest we reconvene at 10.40. Order, order. <laughs>uh, wording like guidance, making considerations, voluntary, uh, etc. Throughout all of this, but clearly there is um, there is law and there are regulations. Might not be as clear as we would like, given the, the answers we've had. Um, but we've, I think we've established that the legislation that stands, or the answers you've given thus far, and you can feel free to disagree with me because I don't want to put words in your mouth, is fundamentally flawed in the sense that it's hodgepodge and it's all over the all over the place, etc., etc. So feel so come back at me if you, if you don't if you disagree with that. But do you therefore think this is the fact that we're in this situation is a cultural issue about not taking disability serious enough? And I'll just go along. Um, so I'll start with you, Doug, and I'll move along the panel. Thank you for the question. Yes, I completely agree with you. The fact that it is such a hodgepodge and that it is so poorly enforceable and unenforceable, I think, is a reflection of the fact that disabled people's access needs are not seen with the priority that they should be. It's, it's easy to say the DBSA and the police and other people and taxi um, licensing bodies should be enforcing more um, because I understand that they have so many responsibilities and duties and um, restricted resources on a continuous basis. But it, um, it is notable that there is this problem that the existing legislation um, is such a mess and isn't enforceable or enforced. And this has been the case for so long. I agree that it, I do think that it is um, uh, an indicator of an underlying um, assumption or problem with, with, with attitude and we, we need regulations um, there's um, bits of technical um, guidance that the Equality and Human Rights Commission wanted to put before Parliament to get converted to a statutory code of practice which is then uh, more enforceable and referable to in court that never got turned into statutory guidance and has mm. just stayed as guidance and um, Baroness Campbell famously said once that um, um, at this stage of, a, of history she is not a fan of guidance what we need is enforceable and enforced regulations to paraphrase her and, and the fact that that isn't there the red tape challenge didn't help you know, we need red tape. It's, it, obviously, red tape is also problematic if it doesn't achieve anything. But as where regulations are um, there, if they're enforceable and enforced, then that is what can mandate disabled people's access. Yes, so, so, some red tape are, uh, is good red tape. But I should have said at the start, sorry, my, I'm Gavin Jones, the SNP MP for Paisley and Northshire North, and also the SNP Transport Spokesperson at Westminster. But if I can come to you, Catherine. Um... Yes, I mean, I, I think I, I would agree. I, uh, I agree with what what Doug has said. I, I, I think that um, the 
there, there are obviously difficulties with, with enforcement, um, but I, I think the, the attitudinal difficulties that certainly that I see in, in the cases that are brought to me, um, the attitude that's, that's displayed to disabled people and to, to their access needs um, is, I think, reflected in the, in the legislative progress that there's been, or lack of progress, um, and the fact that there is such a, uh, such a mess, really, I think, in the legislative landscape for disability, um, uh, and the fact that there doesn't really seem to be much of a will, or hasn't been, to do, to do anything about it, really. Um, I, I think that disability lagged behind in terms of anti-discrimination legislation and, and, and I'm, I'm sure the, the committee will, will be aware that the Disability Discrimination Act, when it was passed, was, was rushed through because a more generous provision was going to be made um, by, by the, the forces that had, had, had gathered at, in '95. Um, because there was no anti-discrimination legislation at all. Um, and then the, the, the government at the time knew that, that something effectively more generous would be passed if they didn't rush something through, and, and so it was. Um, but it had come rather late to the party, um, and as it was, it was, it was fairly inadequate at that time, um, and although changes were made to it. Um, so I think disability has lagged behind, it does lag behind, um, and I think that, that attitude towards it uh, underlies... Um, where we are with with transport in particular and indeed with some of the other provisions. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, I just echo um, Catherine's point about, I think, the attitude to accessibility across the sector. Um, too often it feels like accessibility is seen as sort of like a nice to have, mm. a kind of added extra rather than it being built in and really embedded. Um, and what we want to see at Transport for All is accessibility being considered on a level with health and safety or sustainability. And we've seen across the transport sector industry getting more hot on embedding those elements into all their decisions, all their planning, all their budgets. But often accessibility is sort of left as a, oh, we'll get to that later, um, rather than having it front and centre. And that's kind of seen as well in terms of some of the... Um, the sort of bidding processes or the funding um, opportunities for industry to make improvements. So, for example, in rail, there's the Access for All program, which is delivered uh, delivers uh, rail upgrades for accessibility through a, a process of competitive bids. And our view is very much that accessibility should not be a point of competitive advantage. It should be for everyone. And so why are we asking people to sort of bid against one another to improve accessibility? The other point I wanted to touch on is um, a sort of a wider cultural point, I think, about how disability can sometimes still be seen as a bit of a dirty word. People might be afraid of, of saying that someone is disabled or has access requirements. And we can speculate on whether that's to do with, you know, elements of the media culture or the political culture. But until people realise that it's OK for disabled people to have specific needs and it's OK for us to have those needs met, I think there's still going to be that kind of stigma or that fear of even naming what the problem is here, and that might be why people are perhaps reticent to then offer that assistance or to do their jobs properly to support us. Um, and we need that change, therefore, at a cultural level to prioritise accessibility and also to be, uh, you know, be forthright and say that, that disabled people are a community with specific needs and we have a right to have those needs met. Yeah, thanks. Just before, before I come to Professor Lawson, you mentioned access for all and its limitations with regard to station accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, is it your understanding that there are still four operators who have got an exemption, for, rail operators and an exemption in terms of accessible trains at the moment? That's the last information that I have, which is still four operators three years after, three and a half years after it, was, it came in to force. Thank you for the question. I'm delighted to have Doug here who can answer that much better <laughs> than I can. There are, there are um, most of the temporary exemptions because the industry wasn't ready in time for vehicles have, have now passed. Maybe all of them passed, but there are some permanent exemptions. Some of them are about the platform train interface so that there isn't yeah. level boarding and yeah. that's because of the legacy of platform heights we've got the oldest railway in the country but um, I, I think that that exemption is overused and there should be level boarding coming and then there's things like the toilets on class 158 diesel trains 
um, they aren't compliant and they have a permanent exemption from being compliant and a lot of trains have their side displays permanently exempted and so you know only new trains from now on should meet most of those and some of those they still get exemptions so yes there are still exemptions okay thanks very much and uh, back to you after that detour that i took us on back to professor lawson on um the attitude and the culture but take where the government and operators and everyone else takes disability seriously enough yeah, thank you it's a great question and um i think just to add a couple of things to what others have said um I think disability does get overlooked or, or disregarded or regarded as less important than it should be. And, and that's, that's really evident when, when it comes into potential conflict with other agendas, like the, the green agenda or cy increasing cyclist travel. And um, you know, So floating bus stops are a massive concern for a lot of disabled people. Um, but they're going in all over the place. Um, these bus stops, oh, there's another word for them, what's it called? Um, bus stop bypasses. Bus stop bypasses, where you have to cross over a cycle lane to get to the bus stop. Um, and there are often not, you can't often stop the bikes either, so, so you're having to kind of take your life into your hands to get to the bus. Um, so but so so other other priori other interests are often given priority rather than dis you know disability accessibility being treated as the starting point and other solutions have to be found around that um, which is how it sh should be and I, and I think that's more so in the United States that that happens um, and then other things another example of that is the one I gave earlier on about the audio announcements in buses where um, if if other passengers find it's a bit noisy um, or the driver finds are a bit noisy, the volume gets turned down so low you can't hear them. So they, you know, they become the, the huge value that they have for disabled people is totally lost. Um, so, yeah, a willingness, I think, to put other agendas before disability is, is very evident still, unfortunately. Um, and then, but the second point I want to make is it's not, I think the, there's another issue here which is around um, a tendency in the UK which might be lovely in lots of ways to um, to be pragmatic and build on what we've got already and we do have you know historic ways of dealing with different types of issues so we've this this patchwork has emerged because there's been a, a whole process of building on to what's already there rather than than um, taking an issue and, and trying to overhaul it and make it simpler. Um, and I think in other countries maybe where there's been less um, equality, emphasis on equality in the past, when things like the United Nations on the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has come along and put a big heavy emphasis on access, the right to accessibility and various other things, other countries have been able to respond to that more nimbly than maybe we we have because of our commitments to building on what we already have, but I think it comes to a point where you, where you think, well, what we've already just doing that constantly is is making the problem worse and worse. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so we've spoken about some of the limitations in the current um, law. So I'm wondering, and I'll start I'll start with you this time, Professor Lawson. Um, how effective has case law been in changing practice on the ground in the transport sector? To. There, there hasn't, there hasn't been a huge amount of case law. Um, there were some early cases which were very important. I think Cathy was probably involved in them. Um, roads versus central trains, which is the most beautifully named transport case. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 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 not only the outcome in that case, but the judgment in that case was was incredibly important and and valuable in shaping um, disability discrimination law in in quite a strong way. So that that was very important. I think that was two thousand and four. Um, mm -hmm. So that was under the Disability Discrimination Act. And then we have Doug's case, which which was really significant. But I think the potential for built the, the Pauli versus first bus case but the, the potential for building on that I think has been it hasn't been taken advantage of as much as it could have been um, so it hasn't had as much impact as it as it should in my view um, yeah I'll stop there
Okay, I'll, I'll come on to Catherine and, and Doug, obviously, given that you're involved with Catherine. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think what Anna said is right. I think one of the things... I mean, I, I, I did actually see some, um, some use of, of the Pauli case in particular on, on a couple of cases, but it, it wasn't actually being used in the right way, um, which was unfortunate. But I, I don't think... I think when you have... When you have cases like that, roads did make a, a very significant difference to to things on the ground um, and in subsequent cases. Um, but it was, I think, it was used well. Um, there's no point in having a case that's significant unless you build on that and unless you use it mm. and you get the messages from it out and you need that sort of campaign around it really. And that didn't happen with with the Pauli case. Um, I, and I don't, I don't know why that didn't happen, but it didn't. Um, I think, I think a lot more could have been done with the case than than was, and so it hasn't really had the impact it could have had. I think it has had some impact, but but not the impact it should have had. Um, yeah, thanks. And just before I come to Doug, do you think that um, when issues or cases are settled out of court, it, uh, it lessens obviously the impact on the sector, and obviously operators can then simply ignore. Yeah. Um, what's occurred and what's been said in court? Yeah, I mean, I, that's, that's really problematic. Lots of cases do settle, um, and some of them settle for, for quite a lot of money. Mm. Um, not all of them settle with confidentiality clauses, so then the, the people who've settled them, and I think Doug, Doug makes mention of one that, that I know of that had quite a, quite a lot of money involved in the settlement, um, and where there aren't any confidentiality clauses, obviously you can, you can do things with those in a, in a cam, campaign way, um, and that might have an effect. Um, but they are problematic, obviously, because um, lots of them do come with confidentiality clauses, and it's very difficult to push back against those. Um, and if what's being offered is far more than you're going to get in court... Um, then, then that brings its own problems. So the, in reality, the, the money that you're going to get in court is, is based on a thing called the Vento scale, which, which goes up from, from between 0 to 9,000 and then the, the end of the scale is around 50. Now, most of the cases fall within the 0 to 9,000 mark, which is really comparatively little mm. I mean if you if you've had repeated incidents of discrimination you might get it into the middle band you might get it up to 15 um, but there have only been about three cases I think that have been in the top band so you're looking at you know maybe 30 um, and those have been cases of real real severity and not in the transport sector mm. um, so it, it doesn't cost a lot to, to pay your way out of difficulty. Um, if someone wants an injunction to make a transport provider do something, um, then that's often the way of, that, that a case may, may continue going, but that hasn't really happened in the transport sector. Um, so, so yes, it is, it is problematic, but if you, get a, if you get the right case, you can make a significant difference with it, but you need to back it up with a campaign. Okay, thanks. And Doug, the last word on this section. Thank you. I hesitate to say too much, to be honest, because I'm not a lawyer and I'm in the presence of lawyers who um, know so much more and have so much more experience on this. Yeah, but you've got a case named after you, so... <laughs> <laughs> the case in my name, yes, um, although it was lawyers who fought that yeah, so yeah. well. Um, it, I mean, the case in my name, people, it was specifically about the priority or otherwise that was given to... Um, wheelchair users for accessing a wheelchair space on a bus and still on a regular basis I get people contacting me saying oh you know I wasn't able to get on that bus or yesterday I wasn't able to get into a wheelchair space with a window in my case on a, on a train not a bus because there were pushchairs and prams in there that it wouldn't be moved so it, it, it hasn't resulted in fundamental change on the ground. There's also evidence that some operators, and I'm carefully not naming them, have a sort of contingency fund. So they'll have money that they can throw at people who um, take legal action, um, which is maybe cheaper or easier than dealing with the fundamental problem that is, is the subject of legal action. Okay, thanks so much. Um, flashbacks to my time on the Justice Committee with these sections, but back to you, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Uh, just before I turn back to Graham, uh, uh, Catherine, if I may just ask a supplementary on the, uh, the sort of out-of-court settlements. 
that are made, uh, which companies will want to do for all sorts of reasons. But by and large, do you find that they learn the lessons from these these cases? Uh, and so sort of say, OK, we got this wrong, we don't want to admit it, we'll settle the money. Do they, t- do they then do something on the back of it in terms of say, we'll al- al- alter our uh, way of operating? Um, it, it varies, to be honest. I mean, they, they usually do something, but... Um but I do see people back again because the same things happen again. Now, whether they happen for the same reason, it, it's, it's difficult to tell. Um, but uh, I, I can't say they don't, they don't do something because they usually do. Um, but it, I think it's the extent, of, the extent of what they do and the extent of the lessons learned. I appreciate it was a very general uh, uh, point, but it's just interesting to try and dig in a little to what the company's attitudes are. Um, we touched earlier on the the role of the industry regulators. Um, Graham Morris, I think you, you would like to ask some questions on that. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. And I, I, I do apologise. Uh, earlier, I, I, I forgot to uh, to introduce myself. Um, I, I'm, I'm I'm the voice on the right although I'm on the left of the committee. <laughs> I'm Graham Morris, and I'm the Labour MP for Easington in the, uh, in the north-east of England. And I'd like to ask some questions uh, about the regulators and enforcement. And, Doug, you, you gave a bit of insight um, in relation to the police's reluctance. And, I- I- indeed, you know, we were talking in the earlier section about the Equality Act and the uh, EHRC. But... Earlier this year, we had John Larkinson from the um, from the uh, ORR. We were doing an inquiry into the minimum service levels, and I was asking him about what the implications would be for the staffing reductions that, that, that were that were being proposed on on you know on, on strike days. But just in general. How effective are, are these industry regulators, you know, the Office of Road and Rail and the CAA, you, you said it doesn't apply in the case of, uh, of, of aviation and, 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 and hovercraft and so on, in ensuring that the legislation and, and the regulations are enforced. Doug, what's, what's your experience? I find it varies by regulator. My opinion of the Office for Rail and Road is that when they find out about things that are happening that aren't compliant, uh, so for example Scott Rail failing to have compliant ramps, they can be quite effective at taking action, but because they aren't any part of the complaints procedure um, for people raising accessibility issues, uh, unless people know to tell them, which most people don't, then they don't know what they can take action on. And they can only take action within what's available. Um, The DVSA, um, they had no idea, as I kind of explained earlier, that a lot of these accessibility regulations apply and had no meaningful way of applying them or a mechanism um, or intent to do so. So it varies by regulators and sometimes it it varies by area as well. So for example, particularly with taxi licensing and regulation, um, the variation in approach to either ensuring that there are accessible taxis, vehicles um, in their area, or that um, accessibility law is, is, is followed, is just huge. You know, the post, postcode lottery is massive. I'd, I'd say that there's a lot of um, variation, and also that in general, I mean, I'm going to say this, I'm a bit biased, uh, regulation doesn't meet the needs of disabled people. Thanks. Uh, uh, Caroline, uh, do you have any thoughts on that, the effectiveness of the, of particularly those two organisations? Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely wanted to pick up Doug's last point about kind of the, whether regulation is, is the right answer to the barriers that our community face. And I think I just echo the points I raised earlier about the fragmentation, about not necessarily knowing who is the right person to go to and, and almost being passed from pillar to post if you do happen to go to the wrong regulator or the wrong place first. Um, and again, points I made earlier about accessibility, so having to access things online or perhaps um, websites of regulators not being accessible enough, for example. Um, more broadly, on, on the, the Office of Mail and Road, 
I think it was very interesting to see the evidence given to this committee by their representative at the session he had in September on the ticket office consultations, um, where they were very frank about having no involvement in that process, about not being aware before time that they were coming. I had a a discussion with John Martinson about that, Mm. you know, because the OR was set up after those terrible train disasters in the 1980s, Southall and some, there's a whole succession of them. And their principal uh, responsibility is safety. Mm-hmm. So when I raised with him, I mean, surely closing ticket offices and forcing blind people to use automated machines is a safety issue. He said, well, how is it? I said, well, if there's no staff and a blind person falls on the track, surely yeah. that, that's a fundamental safety issue, which, which, which he acknowledged, but uh, mm-hmm. it had to be pointed out. Um. That's yes. I will, I would just say I, I feel that the disabled community have been raising those issues for almost two years. Yeah. When the, the kind of rumours of those changes surfaced, and um, perhaps the operator would, would do well to sort of really engage with the impacted people on this to listen to our experiences and take them into account. But um, I, I think you know we've yeah we've heard from the ORR that, that they weren't involved in that, and it's not for me to sort of sit here and say what, what the changes should be in terms of the regulation but I would say that that is not that way it's set up is clearly not working for our community if as you say there's a, such a wholesale change being proposed that they're not going fair to, to them uh, the, the OR, oh, I, I don't want to give them a bad rap I, and the CAA but they, they acknowledge that there are deficiencies in yeah. their their abilities so I wonder if I can ask but but Caroline, the whole point of you being here is to express an opinion mm. because the whole point of holding this inquiry is so we can make recommendations. So if you think there is a deficiency, you spell it out and then the committee can take that into account mm. when they're deciding. But I wonder if I might ask Professor Lawson the same question about the powers they have and if you've got any suggestions as to whether they should be strengthened or if there are some good examples, maybe from another country, where, where we should be looking at. Thank you. Um, I think what, what Caroline said about the fragmentation is, is absolutely right. And I know the Equality and Human Rights Commission, a big strand of its strategic work over the past couple of years has been to try and work more closely with regulators in different sectors not just transport, they cover all, all sorts of things, so they've, they've got a big job there, um, to really heighten their awareness of what their responsibilities are under the Equality Act. Um, so there, are, there, there has been an attempt to, to kind of really embed equality into what they do, and I'm not sure how successful that's been. I think um, it, it, Doug's examples are quite hot horrifying actually about the level of non-awareness of, of um, accessibility obligations in 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 their work um, so I, I think accessibility just has too low a profile and, and it should be really at the core if they're responsible if they have they, if they are to play an important role in delivering accessibility mm-hmm. that needs to be very clear in the training in their strategic plans um, and I think they may need more resourcing to go out and do um, the monitoring, the compliance checks as well, if it's them who are going to do it, or we need different machinery. Or more, I, I personally think we need to look at Canada and the United States and think about having a, a, a more centralised um, way of dealing with accessibility that then can reach out to these different regulators um, and that there needs to be resource around checking compliance, whether it's allocated to the resources under the oversight of an accessibility um, office of some kind, or or it needs to be allocated to an accessibility commissioner or, or, or somebody yeah. like that. That's, that's really helpful. I, I, I like that. You've given us some definite ideas that we can take forward. Thanks very much, Chef. Uh, thank, thank you, you uh, Graham. If I can bring in uh, colleague Jack Brereton, though. Thank you, Chair Jack Breaton, uh, Member of Parliament for Stoke-on-Trent South. Um, And I wanted to ask you about the public sector equality duty Um, and maybe go to Catherine first. Do do you think that this has been effective in delivering the changes that are needed in terms of improving accessibility for transport? Um, Well, in 
In short, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the public sector equality duty, um, it, it's, had, it's had, I think, mixed, mixed success, um, both, both practically and, and in the courts. Um, it's, it's a very useful duty if, it's, if it is put at the heart of what is done, which, is, which was what is intended, um, and if, if it is taken into account in every function. I think the difficulty is it has become viewed as a duty of process and of tick, tick box, there's a tick box exercise. Um, and I think the courts have, have vacillated a little bit in, in terms of how they see it, but I think broadly... Um, so long as you, so long as you do take into account, take it into account when you make your your decisions, and as long as the evidence is there for that, um, then what you subsequently do once you've taken disability into account is is not really something a court's going to intervene in. Um, so uh, I I'm of the view that the duty does need to be strengthened. Um, so, for example, that there would be an obligation to um, not only have due regard, but also to take reasonable steps, mm. um, so that there was a positive element to it. Because at the moment, um, I think it, it has become uh, too process focused. Um, it, it, it has the potential to do a lot of good, but I don't think that potential is being realised. Is it, is it applied differently across different modes of transport? You know, um, does it have greater weight, you know, on certain modes than others, and certain? Has it more, been more effective with certain modes of transport? Well, it's only it's only applicable to to public authorities, so it's it's only going to it's only going to bite. Um, so it, it bites in the procurement process, for example, when when um, when the government department is is looking at its um, at its procurement process for contracts, for example, those sorts of things. Um, and the extent to which it bites is going to depend on um, on what they consider their duty to be. Um, and then, of course, it's only it only really gets any light shed on it if someone does a freedom of information request or they seek a judicial review. Um, so that's the other aspect of it. Um, sometimes it's useful on a local level when people are looking at transport plans um, and they use the duty to argue that disability should have a greater input into that transport plan. So it can be useful on a local level as well. Um, but really, with, without something that, that bites, without an obligation to, to do more, um, then it, it has, I think, become too much about process rather than action. Are there any other... Would everybody agree with that? Do you want, Caroline? You... Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of speak to how the public sector equality duty is used on that local level. Um, so particularly, we see it being used by local authorities proposing changes to street spaces, so around walking, wheeling and cycling infrastructure, for example. And oftentimes that process is sort of delivered through doing an equality impact assessment. And um, we would really, really like to see... Uh, wholesale change to how the EQAs are carried out and how they're considered considered. So moving them away very much from a tick box exercise that's done as a sort of desk based uh, exercise that's then shelved and not come back to, that needs to be a really living document. It needs to be produced in co production with the communities who are going to be impacted by any change. And it needs to be done before people have made their minds up. Um, we'd also like to see more transparency around the publication of the quality impact assessments. What sort of legal status do you know equality impact assessments have? Um, they're not required under the public sector equality duty. Um, unless you're in, unless you're in Wales or Scotland. Oh I'm showing my England centricness <laughs> here. Apologies. Um, in England, they're one of the ways that you can show that you've had due regard um, to the duty, um, and. I think it's a sort of example of people seeing it almost as a, as a ceiling rather than a floor. It's like, oh, we do the EQIA and that's done that due regard rather than that should be your starting process. And then once you've got your EQIA, you should be looking at mitigations. You should be looking at actually not doing things rather than doing them anyway. Um, so it's become a little bit of a, a fallback in our experiences for local authorities to sort of do it and then move on rather than it being actually having the impact that it should have. So you think they should probably be strengthened and given more more legal standing perhaps? 
Yeah, I think so. I think also local authorities or anyone that uses eCreos needs the, the right information and the support to do them properly. Um, they should. Would, would there be a process that you, you know, as an organisation, might go through to challenge um, if you disagreed with the findings um, of an equality impact assessment? At the moment, the sort of the most live case we've got at the moment is actually just trying to see equality impact assessments in some cases. So we've made a number. Even seeing them necessarily. We've made a number of applications to the Department for Transport under the Freedom of Information Act to see the equality impact assessment for the programme wide ticket office closures and that has been refused multiple times and we still do not have sight of that. Can, can I just say, just on, on, on this point, it might be helpful. So under the, under the Disability Discrimination Act, um, there were specific duties. So there are specific duties now, but they're, they're very different. Under the, but under the DDA-specific duties, there was an obligation to have an equality impact assessment, to publish it, and to involve disabled people in the drawing up of it. So those duties were there, but when the, uh, when the Equality Act produced a, a, a sort of a cross-protected characteristic duty, the specific duties for England were, were shrunk, basically, so there's no longer that requirement. There was no sort of formal route, you know, if, if there was disagreement, you know, if an organisation wanted to challenge that, there wouldn't be necessarily other than maybe a legal route to, to, to challenge that? No, other than judicial review. Yes, yeah. But that's really with, with the decision that's made, not specifically with the, with the impact assessment. I mean, in terms of um, the Department for Transport and the role that they have in all this, um, you know, do you think there is more that the Department for Transport should be doing, particularly around some of those um, uh, legal aspects? Maybe, Caroline, if you want to just first. Certainly, yeah. So I think the... One of the key issues that we have in terms of the way the Department for Transport are looking at kind of learning from the current situation and looking ahead is it feels like a lot of the issues that we've been talking about today are kind of being repeated and, and built in, so related to the kind of path dependency that, that Professor Lawson has talked about earlier. So if you look at kind of what's coming up in the future of transport, demand re responsive transport is kind of the big thing in terms of Uber buses or <coughs> local responsive transport majority of the vehicles being used for that will have fewer than 22 seats therefore there is no requirement as i understand it for those vehicles to have a wheelchair priority space that is really fundamental that we are investing in and there's there's funding out there from the dft there's there's lots of ways that communities are being encouraged and industry is being encouraged to look at this as the future of transport and yet we haven't got a process there that means that those vehicles will be accessible um, similarly, mobility as a service, which is the platform that a lot of digital kind of providers use to help plan journeys or to do ticketing on the go, really important for multi-modal multi journeys as well. Um, the, the department have kind of are aware of that. There's the uh, MAS, MAAS code of practice that was published recently. It speaks of, you know, you should have consideration of accessibility. It might be useful to talk to disabled people who may want to use your products. I think the department have got a massive role in making sure that we don't end up in, in another 20, 30, 40 years with an even more kind of segregated transport system because that inaccessibility has been baked in because they weren't bold enough to really require and mandate accessibility when they're encouraging the sector to innovate and come up with um, new opportunities. Professor Lawson, in, ter in terms of those sort of legal obligations that the Department of Transport are under to consider um, accessibility when it comes to their uh, policy making around transport, do you think that is being currently done effectively by uh, the Department? Um. <laughs> Well, I, I actually was, I looked through the inclusive transport strategy again last night and I was impressed at the emphasis placed in that, the, the attention given there to um, heightening awareness of the public sector equality duty um, and to embedding, you know, to, to, to coordinating initiatives around accessibility, but obviously that's, that's the intention rather than what actually happens in practice. And I... I, I think um, just to pick up on the question about the public sector equality duty, it's 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 hugely important in that it is proactive. So it gives gives us um, as disabled people, but other people as well, a chance to um, 
it should give it, that's its purpose, to have a voice at the beginning or, you know, to make sure that those concerns are really factored in at the beginning before mm. things become um, embedded. And when we're thinking about transport in the built environment, once they're in place, they're very expensive and time consuming to undo. Mm. But actually, you know, that's why it's so important to, to have a strong proactive duty. Um, and nothing else in the Equality Act really does does that in the same way. So it's 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 I, I don't think it's strong enough to, to meet the purpose for which it's supposed to be. Do, do you yeah. think it? Do you think it's more about actually those policies and uh, those legal obligations that are in place, or do you think it's more about the actual implementation of those that's that's yeah. where there's problems? I think it's a bit of both. Um, due regard is quite vague, and as as as, as Cathy said, you know the England specific duties have been weakened quite a lot um, since 2010. Um, so, so I think having you know the requirements that were there before, and, and I think it is stronger in Scotland and Wales around consultation and around publishing equality impact assessments would would help a lot. So they they speak to how the duties are framed. But even when you have those duties in place, things don't always work that well. So, so in Scotland, there are big concerns as well as in England around how well consultations go around transport issues and how 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 effective they are, um, how, how you know how how much disabled people are actually able to to get their voices heard in processes and, and heard and listened to, I think, rather than just heard, rather than it just being a formality. Okay, thank you. I'll just come finally to Doug. Do, do you think there's any specific things that the department should also be doing to try and improve you know, some of those processes to make sure that uh, people with a disability are properly considered when they are uh, thinking about accessibility of transport? I think there are. It is um, very difficult to achieve cultural change to um, make it so that disabled people's voices are um, made more um, important or given more priority. <coughs> and how that goes about, I'm afraid I'm just not the best person to, to answer. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm very good at pointing out where things aren't right, and <laughs> but mechanisms for such I'm really not good at. I'm sorry. Well, I think we've heard a few of those, certainly the legal ones, um, but um, no, thank you all for that anyway. Okay, uh, thank you, Jack. Um, just moving on to uh, my last set of questions uh, uh, f to conclude this session. Uh, firstly, uh, Professor Lawson, if I just may ask uh, a supplementary. Uh, you referred earlier to the, I think it's the Accessible Canada Mm -hmm. Act, yeah. uh, something we'll, we'll uh, want to uh, examine in more detail. But just to clarify, is it uh, purely in the transport sector or is it more wide ranging across uh, government departments there? Uh, what I'm specifically trying to get at is is there a carryover option for our Department for Transport uh, to, to own a similar piece of legislation here? That, that one, it applies to other sectors as well, so it, it applies to, I, I think, it blank banking, um, I can't remember, other types of service which are regulated by government. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I think that would be the ideal here, we need something like that, but even if um, it just applies to transport, <laughs> that would still be a big help. <laughs> and maybe that could be built on by, <laughs> by other departments, they'd get inspired by what was happening in the transport sphere. Uh, th thank you for that. So it's something we'll, we'll certainly have a look into uh, as we take our inquiry forward. Um, we've touched, also touched earlier on the, the penalties that uh, operators have. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and Catherine, you said the the sort of level of payments are I forget the name of the scale you uh, you referred to, but it's fairly small uh, amounts of money in in the overall scheme of things. What would make uh, operators take their responsibilities more seriously? Is it harsher financial penalties or uh, some other sanction? Um, I'm not. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I I know the I know the answer to that. Um, but 
but I, I mean, I, I can I can speculate. Um, what, what I what I think I can say is that um, is that certainly the the threat of, of the damages that are awarded by courts is is not going to to make um, providers comply with the legislation because it it's not very high. Um, it's not an incentive to comply. Um, I I think that. Uh, if they considered that they were at risk uh, more of, of, of cases, that might make a difference. Um, and I think certainly being taken to court more regularly and having judgments against them might well um, make a difference. Um, actually, having enforcement by, by a body would certainly assist. Um, if, if the rights that that were in, in the legislation, both the European and the Equality Act, whichever applied, um, were enforced in the same way as any health and safety requirement mm. um, it, it, as, part of, as part of any operation. Um, any yeah. business has to comply with a range of obligations yeah. and these should be no different. Um, at, at the moment, they are. Um, so uh, I, I think there, there needs to be a, a a, a, a different attitude um, to, to the obligations that they have. Um. Thank you. Do, do any of the other panellists have something like to add? Uh, Doug first, then uh, Caroline. I agree that it has to be a volume of enforcement. Um, each individual enforcement doesn't um, achieve significant um, set to wide or operator wide change, and there needs to be a wide. Um, it needs to be more effective and widespread enforcement. Um, one case of seventeen thousand pounds or five thousand pounds isn't going to hit an operator, but if the, I mean the number of cases compared to the number of incidents is tiny. Um, and if a, a significant proportion of incidents did face enforcement, then that would make a difference. Um, Stephen Anderson, who gave um, uh, evidence at a previous session, he recently he, he's been taking loads of taxi cases still, and it's noticeable that he gets awarded fifty pounds for a taxi refusal, you know, and and, that, and the invento it, it starts well in theory around a thousand pounds. People would usually get low thousands and and yet for a taxi refusal which is enforced by the magistrates it's it's 50 quid it's but it's 50 quid and in in london area uh, lose your taxi license so i guess that makes a difference mm -hmm. i think there has to be a huge volume of cases that's what needs to happen and for that to happen the whole enforcement model has to go from um, individual disabled people trying to enforce it yourself or getting enforcers to enforce it and uh, proactive duty um, on competent regulators and enforcers to to make that happen thank you caroline thank you um yeah i, th I would uh, definitely agree about the importance of the enforcement and regulation um, I think we also need to see a change in the regulator model that covers the, the gaps that exist. So I mentioned earlier about interchange being a really key part of a journey where things can go wrong. And at the moment, because regulation is fragmented by mode, um, there isn't, it doesn't appear to be very good learning between different parts of the sector when cases are brought or when complaints are made. So I think there's an opportunity for a more kind of centralization of that regulation across all the modes where that learning could be shared and uh, interchange and multi multi journeys would fall under that. And I think that regulation also has to look at training and the kind of culture of staff, both on the front line and also in the head office. Um, I also wanted to just touch on sort of the, the carrot bit of it, I suppose, if that's the stick, which is about the resources that industry need. So I talked previously about access for all and how that's done through a competitive bid process. Um, I imagine it is an interesting position to be in if you're in the industry and you're being told to prioritise accessibility, but you still need to bid for the funds and um, directives from, from industry or perhaps from the department in relation to things like ticket office closures kind of seem to play against that <coughs> initiative. So I think we need to look at kind of how the sector is being directed to prioritise accessibility as well. Anna mentioned the inclusive transport strategy, which was very much welcomed at, uh, at the time by our community as 
a good step and a good kind of signal that inclusive transport was a priority. But given that that's stalled and we are now kind of five years on from that with no clear indication of if it's going to be picked up, if something else is going to follow, or how those the prioritisation of inclusive transport is going to be embedded. Um, I think, again, that just leaves a sort of an open question of what is the, the carrot that's that's being given out, as well as the importance of addressing the kind of stick of regula- regulation. Thank you. And that, that brings me neatly on to my final question. And I'll go down the line uh, for you to, each of you to answer and, and then add in anything else that you want uh, to put on the record that we haven't uh, covered. We're well aware of all the problems uh, that uh, people with disabilities uh, and other mobility issues face. Uh, and we've heard plenty of evidence that since COVID uh, that the experience seems to be deteriorating not improving. But are there any bright spots, are there any operators or local authorities or or other agencies who are actually turning it round uh, and taking their obligations seriously uh, that we could look at? No no one's going to be perfect, but are are there any you would you would highlight uh, as as sort of making a difference at the moment? Doug, I'll I'll start with you and then go down the, the table. There are some that are better than others, I would say. Brighton and Hove buses have got a relatively good reputation, and then there are some councils that um, mandate accessible taxis and take legal action. But um, I wouldn't say that there are any pervasive good examples. Unfortunately, um, you gave me the opportunity to say anything else I'd like to put on record. Um, Somebody commented, uh, uh, a friend campaigner, Flick Williams, that that, um, public sector equality, duty, equality, impact assessments tend these days to say um, that they're sorry you lose impact assessments. They they say, yes, we realise what all of these difficulties are going to bring, but we do it anyway, and that's proof that we have... um, that we have had due regard, you know. Um, so I, I have significant issues with public sector equality duty. And I, I just want to say as well that I think it's really great that this committee is, is looking at this key issue for disabled people. And although I don't represent disabled people, I would like to thank the committee for doing this. Thank you, and thank you again for uh, sharing your experiences yeah. with us. Uh, Catherine, we will turn to you next. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't... I can't give examples of, of specific uh, specific authorities or providers who who are particularly good. I, I think what I what I would say is that um, I have noticed more of a willingness um, for uh, for defendants that I deal with to meet with claimants to discuss um, what the issues are and to look at mediation for example which I think is a positive um, to look at what changes that they can make um, whether or not they make those changes and how they take those forward is another matter but I think at least a willingness to look at that is is a positive that I would I would take from it um, I, I'd like to add one one other thing Basically. actually which which is just about the um, it, it it's about um, disability sort of being being behind and being left behind. Um, One of the things I think I've come across in in my practice as a discrimination lawyer is a certain reluctance to treat accessibility issues and the duty to make adjustments as a type of discrimination. Um, And discrimination is about direct discrimination and it's about indirect discrimination. But accessibility is something different. And I think that does cause problems um, in trying to enforce these cases um, because, it's, because it's seen as different in that way, um, in the same way that Anna talked about it being something extra, um, then it's, it doesn't get the same approach. Um, and I have heard um, defendants talk about it being unfair um, it comes across in the education sector in particular, but it also I've also heard it in, in a transport context as well. And I think that sort of attitudinal problem is really, really difficult and something that has to be overcome um, if there is going to be a, a, a difference, a real difference made. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Caroline. Thank you. I think similar to Doug, I would struggle to kind of name any specific examples of things that are going particularly well. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight, though, is in some parts of the sector and some local authorities, there has been more of a shift recently towards a kind of co-production and engagement approach. So some operators might have access panels or some local authorities might have accessibility forums. And I think we need to go much further than that. We need to see disabled people and our lived experience being as valuable as the professional experience that a designer might have or an engineer might have. Um, industry needs to be seeking that out proactively and compensating for that time as well. So I think there's kind of baby steps in that direction, but certainly not, uh, not solving the issue yet. And uh, last word, uh, Professor Lawson. Um, is, is this just on the good practice? or Good practice and uh, anything else that you'd like to put in the record that we haven't covered uh, okay, in questions so far? Thank you. Um, so examples of good practice, I think, um, I, as somebody who travels by public transport a bit, um, uh, with my dog, um, I found that assistance in tra and train travel is really patchy. But there are some stations where it's just amazingly, consistently good. So I try and make my routes go via those stations if I can. And luckily, one is Leeds, and that might be because they know me there. And, <laughs> but um, another one is Birmingham New Street, which is always incredibly good. Um, and then I, but I think this speaks also to the patchiness of it. Um, booking train assistance um, with a guide dog, a big guide dog, <laughs> um, we used to be able. We used to have one number where we could book assistance, and it was possible to book, to reserve an extra seat so the dog could go on the floor, be tucked in on the floor, away from the aisle. On most providers now, that's no longer possible. So it's always about you can get assistance, you can book a seat, but the dog. There's no room for the dog, um, and there's there's there, there's no you know somebody sitting next to you who you don't know. You can't tuck the dog in on top of their feet and your feet it just doesn't work so the dog then becomes a trip hazard for everybody walking up and down the aisle yeah. um, anyway sorry that's the problem <laughs> but there are one or two providers who do still allow you to book a, a reserve a seat for the dog um, so they're out of the way so and I can't remember which ones they are but but that's patchy um, in terms of things that I haven't I, I think just I'd like to pull out the fact that although I would love a wholesale review of the Equality Act that's quite a big ask, that's a big undertaking. Um, and I think something, it, while we're working on that, maybe, we could do something else, like something around um, an Accessibility Act, which just picks up on some of the issues that we've been discussing today. Um, so yeah, are you, we've talked a lot about the problems of the Equality Act and how that needs addressing, but I think that's been raised a lot in the past and it's still sitting there. So there was a committee in 20. 16 um, House of Lords committee that looked at this and had very strong recommendations but there, not many of them have been acted on um, and if we wait for that to happen we might be waiting a long time while these problems persist. Thank you very much. Um, can I once again thank all four of you uh, for your time this morning. Um, I think it's been a very informative uh, session. We've learned a lot uh, and, and that will certainly influence the, the work we do in this inquiry and the conclusions and recommendations we'll make uh, at the end of it. Uh, but once again, thank you for your time today. It's very much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Order, order.